You know, British crime fiction used to be so quaint. You know, once you got past all the killing, that is. I mean, you had your grannies. I've got it, Inspector. And Prothero did kill her husband. Your eccentric gents. And they all solved murders ever so politely. We don't fancy your sort of bloke in these parts. Then along comes Ian Rankin to rewrite the mystery rules. And how'd he do it? Well, for one, his Inspector Rebus was Scottish, also a bit of a loner, and Ian could relate. He grew up in a rough coal mining town in Scotland. Felt like an outsider, and to escape, he just wrote poems and short stories in secret. He also loved rebel groups like the Stones. Their music wound up in his books. How? Well, we'll get into it. His first Inspector Rebus novel, published in 1987. And with 17 books, Ian was the best-selling crime author in the UK. Take that, Miss Marple and your bloomers. Uh, his Rebus books have been made into a popular TV series, but success has not come easy. Ian's mom died when he was young, and his second son has a rare neurogenetic disorder. Not surprisingly, darkness and unease are channeled through his books. And now at the height of his success, Ian is branched out with a new hero. A cop so tough that he polices the police. Makes you wonder what kind of man turns his back on a sure thing. Or as Rebus might ask, what are his motives? Welcome to Ian Rankin. Great to see you, man. How are you? Welcome. Welcome to the show. Thanks. The, uh, I mean, so it's, it's, it's more than the first end of this story, but yeah, this, was there a fear for you in retiring the, the Rebus character? Oh, there was fear from my publisher. <laughs> yeah, no, because I kept joking I was going to do a cookery book next or a historical <laughs> bodice ripper. That would have been so you great. Know? And my wife said, now you've done with Rebus, you can write the great novel. What do you want to do? And I said, I want to write about cops in Edinburgh. You know, so, uh, so my publisher was nice and relieved. And, and that you would do that. Yeah. Uh, is it a character that, this, um, dealing with a new cat, is it somebody that's been in your head for a while that you wanted to bring out into its own series? No, I, what happened was Rebus lives in real time, real world, hit 60. At 60 you retire if you're a cop in Scotland. Um, I wanted still to write about the cops and happened to be introduced to someone who used to work in internal affairs. Yeah. And I just thought this is a really interesting job because everybody hates you. Your own kind hate you, they mistrust you, they don't want to see you walk through the door of the police station. Um, you've got to work well on a team, you can't be like Rebus, you cannot be a maverick, you cannot be dangerous and complex and, you know, a little bit maladjusted. Um, and this guy, I thought, how do you make that interesting? To me, it was interesting right from the get-go. How do you make the unlikable likable? Kind of, but you know, we all like villains, right? We prefer, right. We're, we like people that are a bit kind of conflicted. Um, and then I found out the disastrous truth, which is that you don't go into that job for your whole professional life. You go in for a maximum of four or five years. Yeah. So like Rebus, suddenly my new character has got inbuilt decrepitude. <laughs> You know, why do, I keep, why do I keep screwing up like that? Well, no, but, I, but maybe you, I mean, you're smart enough to know that that's going to happen. So do you do that so that you're forced to make a change so you don't get too comfortable? Yeah, well, I'm never going to get comfortable because I never know. I mean, we're sitting now here. Next month, I've got to start thinking of the next book. So yeah. I'll start writing it in January. I've got no ideas. I don't know if it's, if it's Rebus coming back. I don't know if it's Malcolm Fox. It could be a standalone new character. I have no idea. Do you get into this stuff partly so you can learn about yourself? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's definitely there. But whether you do it for that reason or not, I'm not sure. I think writers, um, I think, you know, it's, it's cathartic. You're getting all this stuff out of your system. Crime writers would be very dangerous if we didn't write this stuff down. And you must never make enemies, George, with a crime writer, because yeah, yeah. we'll just thinly disguise you, you know, <laughs> uh, and you'll be gone. I'm not worried about that. Bring you'll it on. Gone. I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> um, but suppose you never set out to be a crime writer. I mean, you talk about growing up in a mining town and how... It's tough times, man. It's been, you, you know, remember the big, the English mining um, controversies? I mean, this is of yeah. your era as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, uh, my dad was the youngest of, I think, five brothers, and his brothers had all gone down the mines, but my gran started to see what mining was doing to the guys who went into the industry, so he wasn't allowed to become a miner. Mm -hmm. He went and worked in a grocery store as a grocery clerk. Uh, uh, but every, all my uncles, you know, and they had injuries, they had broken limbs and emphysema and all sorts of stuff. It's not a great job if you want to have a long, happy life. Right. And and so it, but it was all great as well because it was like everybody in that community had come into that village because of that job. And so everybody knew everybody else, everybody was kind of, you know, it was a dem democracy. And it was a, also a little bit like a tribe, but then you don't want to stick out from the tribe. Right. So as a writer, as a teenager, I'd be sitting in my bedroom writing love poems to, un, you know, girls I would never be able to get right. at school. <laughs> Did you, you ever know. deliver them to them? No, I used to hide them under the bed. You know, my mum would think Ian's very quiet and she would sort of bring me up a cup of tea every 15 minutes and I'd be hiding stuff under the bed. <laughs> I think she thought I was doing drugs. Right, you know? could be. And I, I would have been less embarrassed to say, yes, mum, I'm a heroin user, than to say, actually, I'm writing love poetry, you know. <laughs> to girls I'll never speak to. <laughs> to girls they'll never speak to me. 
That's well, how writers become writers, right? Yeah, I mean, it's why guys become pop stars as well. well it's, it's, it's just a, to try and get girls to talk to them. Well, it's a way to... Yeah. <laughs> it is. But it's, it's also a way to prevent over-internalizing, right? You need to get this stuff out. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean just, everybody's life has got difficulties and challenges. I mean, with, with your son with a condition that he's got, there's a lot of work that has to go into this. Is part of this about getting stuff out? Just anger yeah. and rage? Well, I'd, I'd always written to make sense of the world. From when I was a little kid, I'd written to try and make sense of the world. I arrived in Edinburgh at university. None of my family had ever gone to university before. I started writing about that process to make sense of it. started writing about the city to make sense of it. When my son came along and we started to get... You know, doctors were saying, well, he might never walk. And, uh, he's got a, a condition, right? It's, it's called Angelman syndrome, yeah. uh, and it's quite a wide spectrum. The kids tend to be blonde and blue-eyed because the tiny bit of the chromosome that's missing is next to the bit for albinoism. Right. So they're very, very fair. They almost look like brothers and sisters when you see Angelman's kids together. But, you know, he's quite low down in the spectrum because most of them walk, he can't walk. Some can, they never speak, but some of them can do sign language. He can't really do sign language. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of work. But, you know, the, but through having a, a kid with special needs, I've met everyday heroes. Every day of my life, I meet parents, family, friends of families with special needs kids who are going the extra mile. Yeah. You know, pubs, bars, where they're having a kind of raffle to try and raise money for a wheelchair. You know, I mean, Rebus has been good to me. Rebus has made the money that helps me make my son's life that bit easier. Right. There's an awful lot of families out there that don't have that. Yeah, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? It's tough, but I don't think it's heartbreaking. I think, I think you know, I, I think it, it makes people stronger. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying we realize how the struggle that we, we haven't got to a society yet which has found a way sure. to really help out. No, look, you, I mean, you can tell a society, you can tell how strong a society is from the way it deals with people with special needs. Yeah. Straight away. Well, how, what is it, how do you think our society holds up? You know, there's worse. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm kidding. I'm always worried about a society that doesn't trust literacy, yeah. a society that closes libraries, a society that doesn't merit education. Um, and a society that tries to take away, as is happening in the UK just now, tries to take away uh, benefits from people that really need them. I was wondering about when you're in those moments when, let's say, you can't sit down and write or you've just got your mind's busy and going elsewhere. Have you got a go-to song? I know music's a big part of your life. Have you got something that you just put on and... That's your getaway? Depends what mood I'm in. Yeah. Sometimes Silver Machine by Hawkwind will do it. It yeah, cheers me up for some bizarre reason. Uh, and there's a song by Van Morrison. I, I went through quite a dark period when, um, when I was living in London, before Kit came along, mm -hmm. uh, and was you know having panic attacks and stuff. Doctor said, you've just got to get out, you've got to go. I jumped on a train with some tapes, and I ended up in a little seaside resort in England, way out of season, nobody was there, and I just walked up and down the beach with the headphones on listening to Van Morrison. Snow, on, snow in San Anselmo. Isn't that a bad one? That's pretty beautiful. Yeah. You're a big Stones guy too, right? Love the Stones. Yeah. 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 I've only ever seen them once in concert. Uh, in the, when they were good era or in the, when they were show era? <laughs> <laughs> what is it Bob Dylan says? Without Bill Wyman, they're just a show band. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a relationship between two? Do you listen to music when you write? Yeah. yeah. Instrumental music. So a bit of jazz, electronica, uh, German prog rock. It's all good. <laughs> It's not there for me really to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's just in the background, really low down in the volume, just to shut out the real world, so I create a kind of bubble. Which part of the world are you trying to make sense of now? There's so much going on. Oh, man. So if you, were to, if you were to write another standalone and you needed to get something out, what would it be? You know, I mean, if, if I want to try and understand, say, the financial crisis that we all seem to be going through, I would turn to the thriller writers. Mm -hmm. The thriller writers have got an immediacy to them. Someone like John le Carre, yeah. Frederick Forsyth, that kind of guy can tell you about the way the world is and the markets and everything else. and how? Because you, Can you try and explain economics to me? Possibly not. I once did a TV series on evil. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what makes people do bad things to each other? What do we mean by evil? And I talked to one psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, who said the, the very elements that would make you a successful psychopath are the same elements that would make you a successful businessman. Right. Lack of empathy. Right. The inability to empathize with other human beings, just see them as, as ants to be crushed beneath your boots. Mm -hmm. As long as you're doing okay, doesn't matter about them. But can you teach somebody empathy? Is that a skill? Is that something that can be learned? It's a good question. That's a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure. Because I, I, I want to believe in a world of rehabilitation. I would like to think that everybody can rehabilitate, but I know that that's not true. Although, you know, there's, very, there's precious few evil people out there. Yeah. Um, I'm I mean, not even sure are, I believe in evil. Just well, people, yeah. there are people who do evil acts, yes. and it can be circumstance, it can be a chemical imbalance in the brain. There's a certain set of, you know, there's certain reasons why people might do terrible things, and and a lot of killers will say when you interview them, oh, this kind of red mist descended, and then when the red mist cleared, there was someone on the floor, yeah. and I knew I was never going to kill again, 
you know, but they still got to go away. Right. And I interviewed a guy on death row in Texas uh, who said, you know, coming to jail saved my life. I was in a gang, I was doing drugs, I was breaking into houses to get money. Six months more of that and someone was going to shoot me dead. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to die. He'd been in jail at that point for 12, 13 years on death row in Texas. And he learned to read and write in jail. You know, I, I walked up the line of these guys in these little glass cubicles waiting, all on death row, all waiting for people to come and talk to them. And it was, you're, you know, you're poor, you're Hispanic, you're black, low education, uh, some of them with me mental health problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, you didn't see too many rich white bankers in there. All right, stick around. We're going to get Ian's thoughts on some of the other great characters in crime fiction. More with Ian Rankin after this. <laughs> We're with Ian Rankin. We've moved for a second. You were talking about the documentary, right, and, and, and evil. Mm. At the end of the whole series, in terms of good and bad and evil, what, what, did you come to a conclusion of any kind? After months of research and talking to lots of people, uh, I came to the conclusion it's much easier to point to an evil act mm -hmm. than an evil person. Someone who's irredeemably evil. There are very few of them out there. Why is it that people love villains? Good point, huh? I mean, we do like a villain. We really do. Yeah, I mean, Satan. We even like our heroes to be anti-heroes now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're writing about cops, you know, I mean, a good cop, a nice cop, a clean living cop who's happily married and has family and that and just goes back home at the end of the day, forgets about the job. <laughs> That's right. No, 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 conflicted, alcoholic, yeah. you know, using violence, yeah. broken marriage. That's what we want. We want them to be more like us. Yeah, we do have a... <laughs> We do have gaps in our reasoning, don't we, as people? Well, the reason I ask you is because uh, as a great uh, fiction writer, and uh, there's lots of great characters in, in crime fiction, both heroes and villains, we wanted to get just your thoughts on some. So let's start with the hero category right now. Let's bring somebody up here. Bring your hero. So let's talk about Philip Marlowe. What does Marlowe mean to you? Uh, Philip Marlowe is a really interesting character because if you, if you dig into the roots of Philip Marlowe, what you come back to, and this is going to freak you out, is the grail myth. It's, the, the it's, grail? It's, it's King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. A, he, he saw him as being a kind of knight errant. Um, Chandler was, was English educated yeah. at a very posh school in London. He had a classical education. It's the author, yeah. And what he's doing is he has this guy who's basically, uh, I mean, Marlowe was originally going to be called Mallory after Mort D'Arthur. Right. He wrote Mort D'Arthur. And he has him go after damsel di damsels in distress and rescue them from dragons, the gangsters who are trying to do them down. George Smiley. Talk about Smiley. Smiley's an interesting one. He's the anti-James Bond. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you think that spies have all got great, su super cool laser guns and Aston Martins with rockets in the back, no. He's a kind of quiet, unassuming guy who just gets the job done. Much more realistic, much more gritty. And the new film, if you've not seen it, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, is excellent. Let's go to villains now. Some of the great villains. Okay, Hannibal Lecter, a classic villain for us, right? In this yeah. generation. And again, I, you go, you go, watch, the, watch Lecter progress as the series goes on. It becomes much more like fairy tale. It's almost Beauty and the Beast mm -hmm. retold. So, I mean, there's much more to this than you might think. He's not just a really scary guy. He's a very interesting character. And he's also got that charm about him. We wouldn't mind going to dinner with him yeah. as long as he knew he wasn't going to eat our brains. That's true, right? yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, I, when I was a kid, my Uncle Paul gave me the complete Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, collection, which I read a lot. I don't know if uh, in Scotland if, if Holmes was huge there as well. But Moriarty is one of the great villains of all time. Yeah, and, and again, no, not many people know Conan Doyle, Edinburgh born and bred. That's right. He was a Scottish guy. Um, and, you know, his, uh, Sherlock Holmes, based on one of his lecturers at Edinburgh University, a real guy. Uh, Moriarty, we don't know who he's based on, but he's a really interesting, intriguing character who almost is so like Holmes, it's almost like Cain and Abel. Yeah. You know, they're almost like brothers and one is going to destroy the other, you're just not sure which is going to kill which. Yeah. How about this one here? It could be, I mean, look, there could be four different ways we could represent the Joker. <laughs> Cesar Romero being my favourite. Um, the Joker is a, is, is a villain for you. Well, you know, when I was a kid, not many books in the house, but I was passionate about comics. Loved comic books. There were a lot of great British comics out there, but also American Batman, Superman. It was always Batman for me, and the Joker was the scary one. You know, I mean, anything that's to do with a fairground is freaking me out straight away. <laughs> you know, clowns, guys that run that, that run the Dodgem cars, yeah. you know, these are all weird guys, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Joker, you know, they've, they've done interesting things with his backstory as the series has progressed. Of course, in the film, The Dark Knight, mm -hmm. unbelievable. I mean, terrifying and an amazing bravura performance. So he's, he's, the, he's the villain of, you know, the villains want to be. The book is called The Impossible Dead. It's a real pleasure, Ian Rankin. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to talk about Rick Mercer and play with great rant right after this.